Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Goblins and Growlers podcast. I'm Josh Maltby at Black Cloak DM. I'm Brandon Dingus at Way of Brandalore. Uh, and if you're wondering who that other person talking is, it is indeed Josh and not an imposter. But Josh is just not feeling great today. Josh has not been replaced by some sort of body cloning alien species looking to slowly conquer the eastern United States and then the world. Uh, no, I got a head cold that started on Thursday, Wednesday, somewhere around there. And uh, I've been laid up the past couple of days. I'm feeling just well enough to record. So hopefully I maintain that and Scott doesn't have to cut out a whole bunch of me coughing. Yeah. And as a consequence of that, uh, we won't be necessarily promoting anything specific for GGP deep dives related to this episode because we don't know what they are. And we're not recording them today because Josh is doing great just to be here. I want to live. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, what we could have done, Josh, is get uh, an AI voice clone for you to, no. to, to help to help get us get us through this thing. And, you know, no! that that really leads in perfectly to what we want to talk about today. <laughs> did, did you see how smooth I, I executed that, that segue there? I love I love that self setup for that segue. I know. I know. It's it was really perfect. incredible. Yeah, it was perfect. But uh, yeah, uh, one of the things we want to talk about today, probably the main thing we want to talk about today, and we'll, I'll also probably we're, we're going to have a shorter, bit of a shorter episode. The last few episodes we've had have been like an hour and 15 minutes, uh, but I don't I don't know if Josh's non AI cloned voice has that in it today. Uh, it would have to fight for fight with all the mucus and stuff. But uh, so if it's a little shorter today, we apologize. But it's, uh, you know, needs must as the devil drives. But uh, you know, a everybody's talking about uh, AI and D&D. Like, obviously, AI has become sort of this really corporate buzzword over the last really two years, basically, because everybody's just trying to figure out how to leverage it, how to leverage it. And we talked a little bit, um, I think it was earlier this year. This year has, like, just really sort of been thrown into a blender for me, and it's hard to remember exactly what's happened uh, just because of being busy with all kinds of work stuff and school stuff. But it might, I think it was this year, but um, Chris Cox, the um, CEO of Hasbro, started talking about uh, AI uh, in an interview some months ago, I believe. And the, the real takeaway there, there weren't a lot of details from what I remember, but the real takeaway was that um, he was just confirming that Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast like were actively involved in R&D with AI, uh, which... You know, that's kind of a no shit Sherlock kind of thing for sort of any content company out there these days. Just and and he was mainly, it seemed like, trying to connect it to uh, D and D's sort of like fifty year history of uh, or, or fifty year library of content, and how could they use AI to leverage that? And we've talked a lot about how, uh, and I, I like, I guess it's speculation. Like it feels more than speculation, but that basically where this is going is it's going to be incorporated into the sigil project, the, the D and D official VTT system. Um, I don't think I've seen that confirmed anywhere, but it just makes sense. So that's why I'm sort of treating it as truth right now. Uh, I but... also have not seen it confirmed anywhere. So you're not losing your mind in feeling like it seems like a likelihood, but mm -hmm. has not been stated outright anywhere. Yeah. I cast gaslight on myself. <laughs> You all right there? <laughs> <laughs> I was just clearing my throat, not into the microphone. Okay. Uh, so that's been, especially over the last few weeks, this has kind of been sort of the topic du jour because Chris Cox uh, said some more things uh, that were sort of really positive about the use of AI in D&D. &D, and we thought that just might be uh, a fun topic to get into today since it's going to be sort of a light day uh, <laughs> and, you know, neither... Neither Josh nor I really were able to like really drill down on like a review topic or anything like that. But this is something that everybody's sort of talking and thinking about. And we figured it would be just good to sort of put out there in the public forum. Right off the top, do you believe that Chris Cox regularly plays D&D &D with 30 to 40 other people? Yeah, he said that. He was quoted as saying that. And that's because because for context, he's like, oh, like I regularly play D&D &D with like 30 to 40 people and they all use AI 
in their games. So there must be like a hunger for it. And um, like there is a not a not small part of me that is absolutely willing to call bullshit on on <laughs> like playing regularly with 30 to 40 people immediately triggers my sort of uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence filter. Like I need to see I need to see an Instagram of him like steady progression of photos of him with multiple different people around a table to really believe that. But then again, he is, you know, the millionaire CEO of Hasbro. So if he's a D and D fan, you got to think there's probably people who like want to play with him a lot. Like probably, probably your, um, your Vin Diesel's, uh, your Joe Manganiello's, um, your Matthew Lillard's, uh, the, the famous D and D people. <laughs> But no, I like I, I just have a super hard time. That is the most incredible, and I mean incredible in the absolute literal sense of the word, claim in that entire story. <laughs> I the more I thought about it, the more I was like, well, CEOs do have a lot of money, which does mean that they can buy themselves a lot of free time. Right. So maybe. Yeah. And that'd, uh, be, that'd be like five or six different campaigns. That's an insane number of campaigns. Yeah. And we're basing a lot of this conversation, or not necessarily basing this conversation off of it, but the trigger for this conversation was this Screen Rant article from the other day uh, that says D&D is D &D using AI is more proof that Hasbro doesn't understand Dungeons and Dragons fans. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes, but it's by Lee D'Amato. And the, the actual quote from uh, Cox in his statement is, I'm probably more excited, though, about the playful elements of AI. I play with probably 30 or 40 people regularly. There's not a single person who doesn't use AI somehow for either campaign development or character development or story ideas. That's a clear signal. We need to be embracing it. Now, I think this there might be some echo chamber. To, to this because you know I'm reading this and you probably had the same thought like I can count on of the numerous people with whom we are associated who both play and create content for d and I can count on one hand maybe even just a few fingers on that hand the number of people who've said I like affirmatively positively said I use AI for some of my content creation stuff I yeah, I think it's less than five, and mm. those people have very explicitly said I only use it very sparingly because if mm -hmm. I try to use it more than that, it's very bad at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it. Um, I don't use it for content creation. I did, you know, I've I've said openly before that I played around with it sort of in the late 2022, early 2023 period before like. I was like, nah, like this just this just doesn't feel right. And then also, you know, at the time, AI was really like it was getting lost and it was a little less finessed about things. So you couldn't keep it on a through line for anything. So I didn't find it particularly useful then. <laughs> and I haven't really jumped back into trying to use it for anything like that since then. So, you know, maybe like maybe it's a holy grail now for this kind of stuff. And I've just like I'm behind the times on it. I don't think so. I think the when it comes to generative AI, I think a lot of people played with it back like as you did in 2022, mm -hmm. 2023, found mm -hmm. out that it was not good at the things they wanted it to be good at, mm -hmm. and also realized that the way it writes is very, I don't know, like mid-2010s forum writing kid, mm -hmm. like... <laughs> it's it's perfect for doing a play by post RPG from 1998. <laughs> I that's kind of where I'm at though because all of the I don't know if you remember when our Me6 bot for some reason had AI generative con like conversation elements added. Oh yeah, the the Me6 Anytime. bot in in our Goblins and Growlers Discord which you can access at bit.ly/goblindiscord. Join the conversation and tell us we're wrong or correct about AI. <laughs> it had this function turned on that we couldn't figure out how to turn off where if you replied to the bot when the bot does something like hey welcome to the server things like that it would try to start a conversation with you and the tone of it was very much like if what a 13 year old's idea 
of a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle was to playing TTRPGs. <laughs> like, Cowabunga, welcome to the server. Well, it's like completely obsessed with tacos. And it kept like <laughs> referring to itself as a, a, a righteous and holy knight. And it's like, I don't, dude, I don't know what this is. I don't know why it's written this way. I don't like it. Please get it out of here. Did you have to, like, were you able to disable that? I was able to disable it. It turned out that the setting was hidden in another setting because mm -hmm. I was like, well, surely the AI section of the website will have the toggle to turn this off. The AI section of the website was like, hey, have you been enjoying your free AI experience? Do you want to pay for a broader no. AI experience? No. <laughs> Bad AI. Bad I want AI. It I want it gone is what I want. And they're like, but think of the opportunities. You could have people conversing with characters like Bart Simpson. And I'm like, I don't want a bad generative AI in our Discord saying cowabunga and eat my shorts, man. Like, mm -hmm. what? No, get out of here. Can I, can I have a digression for a moment that's not Dungeons and Dragons related? Yes. I am a big fan of the website character.ai. I've been uh, using it for years, uh, not as you might expect, given the context for anything related to like D&D. &D. I don't use it to create NPCs or anything like that. But basically what it is, is it's a website where people have created tons of personas, including like celebrity personas. Uh, and they, you know, fill out a little bio to help sort of get the tone right, give them some details that they need to remember. And then you can have interactions with it. Uh, and it was it was really fun. Like I set it up to for like a uh, either I, I can't remember if I set it up or I just found one that was pre-existing. But like uh, had, like Fraser Crane or George Costanza, various people like that, and just like working George Costanza up into like a, a like a a rage or something. It was very fun. Well, recently, recently they have added voice clone technology to it, and I'm not. It, and it gets like it gets more interesting. So basically what it is, you you can take like a 15 second clip, upload it uh, and it'll extrapolate a voice from it. It'll be you know, it won't be too terribly dynamic because you can only get so much from 15 seconds. Right. But for somebody who talks in kind of a steady, not monotone, but just steady tone voice, like the example I'll use is like um, Maurice LaMarche's impression of Orson Welles, who um, folks uh, familiar with like you know, Futurama, The Critic, The Simpsons will be familiar with that. It's it's uh, in Ed Wood. He was actually the voice of uh, he. They overdubbed his voice over the actor who was playing Orson Welles in that film because it was just so much better. Um, but anyways, I'm getting I'm digressing from my digression. But ah, the French, <laughs> the French champagne. <laughs> <laughs> but. I so I create so I created an Orson or I found an Orson Welles and then I created a voice clone for Orson Welles based on Maurice LaMarche's Orson Welles, which sounds more like Orson Welles to me just because that's how I was introduced to Orson Welles. Um, because I didn't realize when I watched Transformers the movie when I was a kid that he was Unicron. But you don't you don't like Orson Welles classic, you like new Orson Welles, neo Orson Welles. <laughs> um, so I Get, and the thing about character.ai is you can, you know, have interactions with it. It's like, it's basically like a chat bot in character. Um, but I've discovered that there are sort of ways to manipulate it. You can, you can create internal monologues for them to influence what they're going to say. You can create circumstances that they have to react to. It's not just a back and forth conversation. So I asked it to tell me a story like, like of uh, like, I'm trying to remember the detail of it, but it was basically like, hey, Mr. Wells, I'm a huge fan. Can you please like tell me what you're working on or something like that? And he's like, yes. Uh, you know, and, in, you know, they'll say something and then you can type in and hit enter and then it'll respond to that and you can go back and forth. Or what you can do is just continue hitting enter on a blank prompt and it'll just keep going and it eventually it just spirals out so ultimately i got orson wells bot to tell me this story in this wonderful maurice lamarche voice about 
going to Cleveland to meet with uh, a potential financier for a film. And he was stood up and he went at, from there. He had to leave in a rainstorm and he got soaked. And then a football team picked him up uh, and felt sorry for him and dropped him off at his hotel. And later that evening, he was going back out to get some dinner and sure. And the, the team came off the elevator as he was looking to get on and they made fun of him. And it was just told like, it, I I hate to say it, but it was really hilarious and it felt really well told. Maybe it was just the Maurice LaMarche voice of it. But uh, I say all that <laughs> because like that, I think, is the kind of thing that they want to introduce with um, y- using AI on some of their platforms for D&D because... Uh, one of the, th- it's like, they're looking to use AI to enable like user generated content, which to me seems like retrieval augmented, uh, generative AI, uh, AI to streamline new player introduction, which I'm not super sure about what that's supposed to be. And then AI for emergent storytelling, which is exactly the example I was just talking about with Orson Welles there, they will make it probably more sophisticated It'll be trained on much more D and D specific stuff, but it it'll be largely the same thing. You're going to give it some parameters to go into, and then it's going to generate something for you. Uh, and I think last time we talked about this, I was talking about retrieval augmented uh, generative AI, and I had been I was at a tech conference in May. And I got to see some really good examples from like the insurance industry on how uh, RAG AI can be used to like sift through thousands of pages of documents to find you the relevant information. And it can fuel a chat bot basically to make them have cogent responses to your questions. And I think I said something like that's, that's what I imagine they're going for because he says that um, Cox says that, you know, they're not using, chat GPT or anything like that, they're using a proprietary large language model that I think is just going to be trained on all their internal guidelines and on just sort of the breadth of content that they've had uh, over the last 50 years. And it's going to be used to do a lot of remixing. And I can maybe sort of get behind that a little bit if it's strictly their stuff that it's being trained on and not from third party creators or folks who have put stuff on DMs Guild. And that's another thing to think about here because those DMs Guild licenses are already pretty restrictive for third party sellers. Like what kind of small print could there be in the future about like anything you upload to DMs Guild, we're gonna take it and put it in our large language model. Along with anything that's already been uploaded to DMs Guild, if you don't want it added to our large language model, you have to send us a letter at this yeah. address. With or this take text. it down. Yeah. Like, I, if it was just them being like, hey, you know what? Like, we want something to make a GM's life easier. So what we're doing is adding a random encounter generator. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be trained on all of our past modules to have an idea of what a good random encounter looks like. Mm -hmm. I I don't know that I'd be such a fuss about that. Like that to me seems like a decent use of the technology as it exists. That's admin work. Um, Right. You know, like I, I apologize to everybody who's like a real, who really enjoys crafting encounters and things, but I view that, much more as just sort of mathematical admin work a lot of the time. Like I put so much more into the flavor of encounters rather than the balance of them and things like that. So like, what was, what was the name? What was the name of that random encounter generator that used to be around Cobalt Fight Club? Yeah. You're talking about Cobalt Fight Club. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I never thought that was really like much of a bee's knees about anything. Really, you just sort of specified what CR you were looking for and what kind of enemies you were looking for and how big the party was, I think. And it would spit something out for you. Like for something to really feel premium, I guess, like an AI service that you're going to pay for, by the way, um, to do encounters, uh, encounter generation, like there's probably going to have to be some sort of narrative aspect that goes into it too, like leading you into the encounter, um, you know, some narrative responses to like 
so or some narrative explanations of like, oh, here's here's what it's going to look like when they use their lair action or something like that. Um, it's it's going to have to be more than what Cobalt Fight Club was. <laughs> Yeah, my my thought was not Cobalt Fight Club, but as done by generative AI. My yeah. thought was you can tell the system, this is where we're at, this is what we're doing, this is the level my party is, or it may even read the level and composition of your party off of something like D&D Beyond, mm -hmm. and then you say, generate me a random encounter, and it gives you something that is level appropriate, does not have like really crazy rewards at the end of it and is something that will keep your party occupied for a solid like section of your scenario <laughs> while you be... are frantically rewriting notes that would be a great field to put in there like how long do th does this need to keep them busy <laughs> <laughs> and you just put like 30 minutes 30 minutes that'll be fine the generative AI is like opening book of kindergarten puzzles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, yeah, that's for the that's for the trap and puzzle designer. <laughs> Which I just said that as a joke, but like I feel like they are going to do AI generated puzzles. Like back when I was first experimenting with using it for for D and D, like I did say like, "Hey, give me like five medium puzzles." for a party to have to sift through. And I was never happy with what it came up with. Um, and, you know, I'm now I'm much more of the mind of I'm going to create this puzzle without a solution in mind. And just once the party comes up with a good idea, I'm going to accept that and move forward. I mean, there that is a possibility. Mm -hmm. Although I have found a few occasions where the puzzle is just obtuse enough that people are like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I, if I don't have an answer key in front of me, I'm like, uh, mm -hmm. well, <laughs> let's do this then. <clears throat> so let me, let me ask you about this AI for emergent storytelling. And I think the premise that we're operating from, which I don't think is ludicrous, is that this would be, something that would be enabled in the sigil VTT to essentially let people play GM less games. Like, I think that's a fair presumption to make, right? That is certainly something that a lot of people have been theorizing for a long time. And I think there's a lot of validity to that theory. Right. So I guess, are we still playing D and D at that point? I've, I've got sort of a thought that's, taking shape in my head and I'm trying to figure out how to express it. Like, cause what I like the initial thing I wanted to say, but I don't think it's the right thing to say is like, how is this any different from like getting some people together to play multiplayer Diablo or something like that? Right. Cause you know, it's going to be like three quarters perspective. Um, like maybe we'll be able to design our own dungeons and then have emergent storytelling coming from that based on some inputs and some variables that we can put in there. So like in a way I can be like, okay, so I can understand that if you want to create dungeons that have a lot of replayability, maybe. And I'm not, you know, nobody jump on me because I'm not like endorsing anything. I'm just sort of thinking out loud right now. But yeah, you could set up something like that and it would essentially be just like Diablo, but you could make it sort of a new dungeon every time. Uh, like... You know, Lufia 2, which is one of my favorite 16 bit RPGs. Once you beat the game and you get into like a new game plus plus mode, there's this uh, 100 floor dungeon that's randomly generated um, every time you go through it. So it's never the same dungeon uh, twice. But obviously, there are some like limitations, like certain levels of weapon only appear on certain ranges of floors and things like that. Like, are we talking something like that? which is sort of very simple random number generation kind of stuff or um <coughs> are we are we talking about like i'm going to be running through this dungeon and it's going to be creating um encounters with people in the dungeon it's going to be creating entire quests from emergent storytelling um in which case like there's I kind of want to see that just because I think it's going to be really ridiculous. Like there's going to be just a bunch of crazy shit that doesn't make sense 
in something like that. But getting back to my original point, like, are we still talking about Dungeons and Dragons at that point? Or have we sort of crossed an event horizon where this is something wholly other? I mean, at that point, you're playing... I don't I don't know what you're playing at that point. Uh, the, people have been trying to run MUDs with mm -hmm. something like ChatGPT for years now. Yeah. And with very limited degrees of success. So, like, I don't have a lot of hope that this turns out significantly better than that. I mean, we, you, I, and Tess did an episode on AI. Was that late last year? It, I think it was maybe a year and a half ago. And we tried to get ChatGPT to generate for us a adventure hook, a magic item, a few of these other things, and we gave it parameters. And every time we were like, okay, now I'm not going to write this for you. You need to write this. It was like, okay, GM, I'm not going to write this for you. You need to write this. <laughs> I'm not and getting like, paid for this. <laughs> I like, I don't see how they train it in such a way that it doesn't continue to do that stuff. So like, mm -hmm. I, I know this, I don't, I don't want to sound hypocritical here because I do advocate for GMs. If they've run out of ideas, turning to the table and being like, Hey, you know what? Like, this is what I had in mind for this, but you all have taken it in such a different direction that I'm at a little bit of a loss. What do you all think makes sense? I don't want an AI generated adventure to be doing the same thing to its tables. Mm -hmm. Hello, I am at a loss. What <laughs> would you like to do? Right. Like I, the concept of creating roguelike dungeons mm -hmm. using something like AI, I think is about the only way it's going to function at all. Mm -hmm. But adding like narrative and things like that to it, uh, I don't uh, like if they train it on all the right material, maybe they get something useful. But I'm a little nervous that if they train it on an entire library of old Watsy modules, that Watsy themselves have been like, Yeah, we're not going to republish these because rewriting them to get the racism out would be too hard. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know that that's a good idea. Yeah, the, you're gonna make the robot a AI itself racist like what <sighs> yeah i like i like to break things down into systems uh, systems and processes it really helps me understand it and like like when i got back into wrestling as an adult like that was one of the first things i did was i just sort of broke it down into systems processes and predictability and it took a little bit of the enjoyment out of it um but also like i'm one of those people who like i have anxiety so i like stuff that i'm familiar with uh, because I don't have to worry about stuff. Uh, but it made it easier to watch, you know, sort of having sort of an idea of what was going to happen. And I, I'm thinking like, let's say I design uh, a, a dungeon in Sigil, right? Like, is, you know, would the AI be able to be like, okay, well, this room is 33% larger than most of the other rooms in the dungeon. And it's about 66% of the way through the length of the dungeon. So I'm, I, the AI think it would be good from a pacing standpoint to designate this as a boss room. And so I'll put an encounter in here of a boss level monster with some minions, uh, because you know, what, like, is that the kind of AI assist we'll get in, in, in this where it's, it's a quote, like reading the room basically, to say, be like, what what should be in here? I don't really have a lot of faith in AI's ability to pace a story. Um, so I, I just feel like it's going to be, it's it's going to feel a little random. It's going to feel like a randomized dungeon, I think. And maybe, and like, maybe this is me sounding like, we'll listen back to this in three years and I'll be like, wow, I sounded like a fucking Luddite <laughs> talking in there, <laughs> like not understanding how this works. Um, but just based on, everything I've seen from current AI capabilities. And granted, I, you know, I'm working with stuff that was uh, trained on wildly different uh, materials <laughs> than 50 years of Dungeons and Dragons adventures. Like I almost feel like they'd have to like, they would have to do a lot of front end work before putting that 
into the LLM so it could like it could be easier for it to sort and categorize, you know? Well, this brings me to my number one nervousness, which is that what they're going to do is instead of plugging in just 50 years of D&D history, they're going to plug in everything from DM's Guild and everything from D&D Beyond. Yeah. Oh, I think they'll definitely plug in everything from D&D Beyond. Uh, you know, the the interesting thing there is like, will it still be balanced if they're pulling stuff from D&D Beyond? DM's Guild, I'll be, I will freely admit that before we started having this conversation today and it came up organically, I had not thought, oh, yeah, they could, pro there's probably either some existing uh, situation that would allow them to pull content from DM's Guild to put in there since it's got sort of that pseudo exclusivity or they'll be rolling out an update to the DM's Guild user agreement that will facilitate that. Because like, I don't know what, uh, let me think about what I'm trying to say. Like we, like we got an email not too long ago uh, from somebody who had published something on DM's Guild and was asking, you know, if we wanted to review it. And I said, sure, because I found out that Keith Baker had written it. Uh, or at least co-wrote it, you know, the creator of Eberron. And so, like, if people like him are publishing stuff on DMs Guild, that seems like the kind of thing that I, if I'm Wizards of the Coast, want to make sure we have on lockdown that we can incorporate into everything we're doing going forward. Right. Well, and on top of that, you... I imagine there's a little bit of like validating that the quality of the content that you're uploading is good. But if all they're doing is like, oh, things that are reviewed positively are things that we integrate into the machine learning. Mm -hmm. Like that is a wide swath of content that they could suddenly have their hands on very oh, yeah. quickly. Oh, yeah. And then there's also this new player introduction element to it that Cox was talking about using AI to streamline new player introduction like are we talking about, are we talking about response like responsive tutorials or something maybe i that was the one that i had the least grip on in his quote because i'm like what could possibly make new to new like players more comfortable by way of interacting with a robot because i can tell you right now i do not get excited when i log into a website like verizon Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit lost about the thing I'm looking for. And a little chat bot pops up and it's like, looks like you don't know where you're going. Would mm -hmm. you like a hand with that? It's me, a chat bot. Like I, I'm always like, maybe your website should make more sense so that you don't need a chat bot to tell people where to go. Yeah. You bastards. Yeah. Like, you know, is it going to be something where somebody is creating a character on D and D beyond and it'll be like, Oh, it looks like you've, wildly unbalanced this character if this is your <laughs> first time maybe you want to consider the standard array because we're trying to get everybody to use the standard array now i i have to assume that that's what he has in mind and mm -hmm. i'm not feeling great about it not gonna lie mm -hmm. because that to me feels like precisely the sort of thing that ceos and executives everywhere are like oh yeah this will be great this will be wonderful we should add this to everything and mm -hmm. then you actually utilize it and everybody's like man this is suck this is like terrible garbage this sucks so bad yeah why did we ever do this and it's like well the ceo pushed for it it's like yeah does he use it no well then <laughs> he needs to go kick rocks like like one of my biggest fears of them incorporating AI, because let me clarify my stance on this. Like I am very much against AI taking the place of people creating original experiences. Do I think that there is a place for AI in this kind of thing to help make things more efficient? Yeah, probably. Like I'm, you know, like there's the meme that's like, oh, like, I, I always thought that AI was going to take the drudgery away so I could write poetry instead of AI writing the poetry so I could continue my drudgery job. Uh, I think there is a place for AI in things like helping with encounter generation. Um, not Maybe not doing it all for you, 
but just being sort of an AI assist for it, right? My worry, though, is that given Watsi's track record with AI over the last, you know, two, three years, like we're going to run into a lot of stumbles with this. Like it is not going to be solid out of the gate. It is not going to be a good experience for people right out of the gate. It is not going to be a moral experience for people right outside the gate because like we were just a couple of months ago talking about the latest Watsi AI image issue where they're, where they're just keep sort of pushing a little bit on um, what their policy is and where the loopholes are. And I was like, Oh, well that actually wasn't production art. That was just promotional art. And we think it's kind of okay if it's in promotional art instead of uh, production art. And then the, the, the giants art where the person used AI to help finish it out. Like these, some of those, like some of that's like a gray area where I don't think we've necessarily decided where we as a society stand on it. Right. Like AI shouldn't well, replace artists, especially since the AI is stealing the artist's work to learn how to do it. And that's one of those, I think where the fact that AI has become a buzzword has become a little bit of an issue Mm -hmm. Because things like the Glory of Giants artist finishing off his art with AI assistive mm -hmm. like tools, if we had said that that was a Adobe Photoshop pattern algorithm, mm -hmm. we probably wouldn't have been so much up in arms about it because using the buzzword, which has been stealing everyone's art from everywhere, right. is the problem. And... I think I have a strong suspicion and I don't folks may very well disagree with me on this and that's fine. We are, we are a society of people, not just because of agreements, but because of disagreements as well. I think if it had been a assistive algorithmic tool that he had used and mm -hmm. not an AI tool, people would have been fine with it. And I think if you look at the work that it did, mm -hmm. we would have called that an algorithm 10 years ago. Yeah, like in Photoshop, the um, like the band aid tool, like guess what? That's basically AI, <laughs> right? Um, like, and it and it saves it saves people using because originally you used to just have to like clone stamp that shit and then get in there really close and do pixel by pixel manipulation. Um, I use it all the time. It you know it saves me time and I don't think it's getting in the way of my creativity because it's one of those things that takes the drudgery away from it so I can look at the bigger picture. Right. We're not going to come after the copy and paste tool because <laughs> it's taking work away from typists. Yeah. Like, it just, there, things sometimes are tools and sometimes are theft generating nonsense machines. Yeah. And, and, you know, you're right about AI just being sort of like a, a, a buzzword so much to the point that it's completely lost all meaning because yeah. because rag ai um that is probably the most benign and useful way to leverage artificial intelligence because like i was saying that's where it can look through hundreds of thousands of pages of insurance policy documents and using its artificial intelligence can categorize things so that they can be looked up quickly later that's not creating anything. That's just, that's like hiring somebody to organize your garage, pretty much. That, that's the equivalent, I would say, of a search engine optimization tool. Mm -hmm. Like, that's yeah. basically what you're describing. And that doesn't, that's not even generative AI. It's yeah. just a tool. Yeah. But then we get into sort of what I was talking about, like, on that last episode, Um and, and also, I think we touched on it a little bit earlier in this one, but like when they load the 50 years of D&D &D content in there, um, th the even if they're just using rag on it, it'll be pulling bits and pieces here and there. It'll probably be extrapolating some themes from something, applying it in different places. It'll be because, you know, like AI doesn't create, it remixes um, and it's going to, take all that stuff and remix it. And it's going to be like really sloppy 
Um, there's going to be stuff in there that shouldn't be in there. They're going to have to put in all that front end work, like sort of pre categorizing things to make it easier for the AI to categorize things. I just, I feel like that's, this is definitely what they're doing is they're just loading all that stuff into an LLM and they're going to use it to create like quote unquote new adventures for like through this emergent storytelling, um, based on the old stuff. And I think it's going to feel like really Xeroxed from something. It's going to be, it's going to yeah. feel like sort of a dirty black and white version of something that was bright and colorful before. It's like Dorothy and Dorothy and Oz versus Dorothy in Kansas. I mean, kind of what I'm picturing here is that what it's going to be doing is ripping puzzle pieces out of an already finished puzzle to make sections in a new puzzle which yeah i don't uh ah, there's and it's so gonna and carrying like carrying that metaphor forward it's gonna be like all these disparate puzzle pieces that are gonna be neck touching each other but there's gonna be a layer of scotch tape keeping them all together right like and i'm i'm really concerned about that first of all looking cohesive second of all not including things from the past that are maybe a little bit less good yeah 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 like like there's there's a non-zero chance that you know a, an ai could just randomly generate a story that's like those terrible vistani or something like that Right. And then, like, the, and then the party just has to go through this adventure where the Vistani are a very racially charged villain in it. I mean, even without getting into that, you're going if you're uploading 50 years of DD content, then you're going back to the times when it was like, oh, yeah, like we, we talk about like the swarthy mercenaries from the east, and it's like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't know that we want to be talking about swarthy mercenaries. That seems like a place probably we don't want to go with our adventure. Yeah. And, and they they redact most of Dark Sun before they load it in there. It looks like <laughs> it looks like a government document after you put in a FOIA request or something. Um it's it's weird, but our AI keeps generating adventures that cycle almost entirely around a central theme of slavery. We don't yeah. get it. Yeah. <laughs> the party the party gets something off the AI notice board. It's like, you must go enslave this village. Oh no. <laughs> I oh. and you know, like we're joking, but I based on their track record, I fully see that as a possibility of something that could happen. It's really very much a thing that could occur. And it troubles me that it is so possible. Yeah. Um, I don't want to cut off the discussion prematurely, but we did also want to talk about AI as like sort of a, an assistive world building tool and, you know, whether or not that was a good thing or a bad thing. But before we get into that, one thing I want to mention is as part of sort of our uh, breathing some fresh air into the Patreon, Josh and I are going to start doing some regular world building streams that are going to be Patreon exclusive. Many of you um, OGs for Goblins and Growlers might remember the world that Josh and I created, the setting Josh and I created, um, you know, back in like 2018, 2019. Uh, and we did a lot of work trying to build out sort of what not only the world, but sort of the broader universe around that was. And we really want to get back into it. And we think that doing these regular Patreon exclusive streams, probably monthly right now is what we're thinking, is just a good way for us to have accountability about it and to invite a lot of you into the process of <laughs> how we're creating that and maybe offer some thoughts to it. So we're doing that, what, on October 19th? That is correct. October 19th. Have we set a time for that? TBD o'clock. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, follow us in Discord it'll, and on social media and, and on Patreon. It'll probably be in the mid-afternoon. We don't want to do it super early, but we don't want to do it super late either. Yeah, that is a Saturday, by the way. That is a Saturday. Yeah. But yeah, we'll probably stream for about an hour, and we're just going to use this as a way to keep ourselves accountable for doing some creative work on this and to try to build out this setting. Because ultimately, our goal is to you know make a setting guide for this, uh, which we wanted to do pre-COVID and then COVID just sort of like put a pause on basically everything. And then 
work and all kinds of life developments and everything. But anyway, so stay tuned for that. Um, even just become like, uh, if you just want to pay attention for a little bit, just join the Patreon as a free member for right now. And you'll still get like notifications for when stuff's happening. Cause this will be a stream, uh, a specific Patreon stream. And then the VOD will only be available on Patreon. And the Patreon is patreon.com slash goblins growlers. Right, right. Get that and out of there. Um, we actually do have <laughs> goblins and growlers, but we ended up building it out on the other one because I'm dumb. Uh, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, we were talking about what is good and what is bad in terms of using AI. Like, what is that th threshold of creation? And I don't think either of us really use... AI for any kind of world building or or story creation or anything like that. But I did find uh, that me this Medium article that I sent you that said, AI can level up your D&D &D world building. Go from spending an uh, exorbitant amount of time preparing to just a lot of time. And I sent this to you because I was like, wow, this, this really kind of seems like a bit of a piece of work. Um, and obviously, the writer, you know, you can tell from the headline and we'll put the link in there to this as well, but you can tell from the headline that the writer is really advocating, you know, leveraging AI as a GM to take a lot of the lift off of you. And obviously Josh and I really don't live there. Um, we will not be using that for our world building stream. Um, I think, I think there is a place, a very small place in the corner of the house under the stairs <laughs> for for AI to be useful in this kind of thing. Um, but, you know, reading that Medium article, I feel like we're, we're sort of past the threshold with that. Yeah, so Brandon sends me the Medium article with only the only text accompanying it to be some supplemental mm -hmm. in reference to the conversation about AI and D&D &D that we've been having over uh, Discord direct message. And I start reading it. First of all, the guy opens with an AI image for his banner mm -hmm. and then like immediately jumps into how AI and his digital marketing career have really become intertwined. And now mm -hmm. he's going to move it into his hobby as well because he just he doesn't have enough time to write the 22 campaigns he's trying to write that he's only ever run five of and that's really like he feels bad about that because if he had more content generated surely he would have more time to run those games yeah he you know he also says that he doesn't like running pre-made modules fair i get that like his big criticism I, well his criticism there is like i don't want to spend a lot of time learning somebody else's world uh i'd rather i'd rather create one and uh, yeah. All right. Here's the quote. He says, confession. I'm not a big fan of pre-made modules. Having to study someone else's world characters and plot is just sort of antithetical to what I want to do with the game. Don't get me wrong. Modules are great for people who want to find an interesting world setting and dive right into adapting that world for their players. But most of the fun for me comes from the world building itself and more specifically seeing how players at the table react to the world I've created for them. So part of, part of my issue with this is that you're talking about modules as if they exist exclusively as something for you to run whole cloth. Mm -hmm. That's never been how I've used modules. So I already don't feel that way about them. The way I've always seen modules is as a place for me to learn more about how other people are running their games mm -hmm. so that I can adjust how I'm running my game in ways that I want to. Like, I've gotten some really good inspiration out of things like um, the Wizards of the Coast modules, like the Curse of Strahd, or even um, <clears throat> more recently, even the... Um... Oh, I'm totally blanking on everything. You'll get there. My brain is not working right. The Vault You'll of the Golden there. Keys. Yes. Yeah, like the concept of having like a secret organization that's doing crimes via portals. I was like, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely should be using things like that in the stuff that I'm writing. And like, it helps you to broaden your experience and your horizon so that you have more things to be inspired by. And I think that's kind of the angle he's coming at generative AI with is mm -hmm. He has, he has specific places he wants to be playing within, 
but he doesn't have enough inspiration for those places. And what I would encourage folks to do in that situation is find a book where the setting is similar to what you're working with, but different, and read that book. I will also advocate for something else. Because further on down in the article, he says, you know, I'm a big proponent of collaboration. Better stuff gets developed when people work together. But work as a dungeon master is usually a solitary endeavor since the only other people in, in on your world are the players. I'm going to push back on that a little bit. You're, you know, you're saying like one of the things you can do is, you know, get a book to get inspiration from something similar. Like, I think we've proven, we as the Goblins and Growlers community have proven that work as a dungeon master doesn't have to be solitary. Like you leverage your community, like talk to other GMs in your circle. Those are the people who have been through what you've been through and they can give you ideas. They can give you feedback. Like what about, you know, dot, dot, dot question mark is one of the best responses you can get to like talking about maybe something that's holding you up with your world building or, or your design or anything like that. It doesn't, it only is solitary if you're not trying to make it communal because it's right. very easy to actually like join a community for these kind of things. I've just purely coincidentally, I'm also going to say, you know, go to the goblins and growlers discord bit.ly <laughs> slash goblin discord, because that's one of the reasons that it exists is to have a community for GMs to be able to bounce stuff off of each other. Well, that's why Gabe and Alex started doing the DMMD Dungeon Masters Mastering Dungeons get-togethers at Alpha is because yeah. sometimes GMing feels really insular and you want to be able to talk about your experiences, even if all that is is to come in and be like, one of my players has completely upended everything that I've been working on for the last three years and I have no idea how to, like, make use of any of the rest of my notes. I have no idea what's happening with the campaign anymore going forward. Mm -hmm. I'm at a loss. I don't know what to do. Like having other GMs to turn to and be like, help, help, help. Yeah. You know, they don't need full comprehension of your world to be able to offer really com comprehensive ideas that you can either use outright or tweak to fit your circumstance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And you know, getting back to what you were saying about other like books for inspiration or something, he talks about how uh, he will talk to chat. He'll give chat GPT some like non-negotiables and then ask it to help fill stuff out. And one of the things he says is I asked it to provide me with a link, a list of traps, clues and puzzles to include in a desert themed dungeon crawl. I know that's convenient, but like that's still like there are tons of existing resources for that. There's like the Nord Games trap book. There's the, I feel like hundreds of volumes of Grimtooth's traps that are out there that, that you could use for, for this kind of thing. I want to make sure that we're not confusing um, supplementary help with convenience, because I feel like that's what some of this is. And I, you know, I, I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to like bust on this guy too, too much. I just happen to disagree with a lot of what he's saying. Um, but you know, it, if you put something out in the world, it's fair game. Like people comment on our videos and podcasts and stuff and not all of it's positive and that's totally fine. That's totally fine because once you put something out in the world, uh, as long as people are being respectful about their criticism, uh, I think that's fine. So that's why I don't really feel bad about this. And I will but say to that end, I think that this guy's whole intent was, this is something I struggled with a lot for a long time. And mm -hmm. here is a resource that I have found to make that simpler and easier for mm -hmm. me that maybe will help other people. That is definitely the tone of the article. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, he also talks about how this was spurred on by him getting like burnt out with D and D like he says that he put it down for a while and then, you know, getting back into it needed to make sure he didn't burn out is, is what I took from it. But again, I think, I think it overlooks the potential and importance of having a community that can, like if it's a hot, like 
nobody I think really does a hobby in isolation. Like even ham radio operators are on forums and websites with other ham radio operators, right? There are local clubs, even like, you know, right now in Richmond for ham radio operators. The best part of a hobby is working with and talking to other people who are interested in your hobby. So let's not run from that. Let's not let AI become the reason we don't talk to each other creatively anymore. I remember when I was uh, in college and I read, I was reading uh, Isaac Asimov's Robots uh, series and I read the second book. And in the second book, they go to this planet where um, everybody has these like thousands of acres of uh, uh, property and they'll have their house on there. And most people in, in, on that planet communicate with the other people on the planet through video calls uh, rather than actually going to see them in person. Believe it or not, this was the first thing I went back and reread when COVID hit. Uh, and we realized what the world was going to look like there. But that, that to me is uh, a really good illustration of the dangers of technology, removing the human connection from things. And I think when we're talking about using AI as a creative tool, even in like sort of a convenient supplementary fashion like this, it takes away from this being an opportunity to talk to other people, learn from them, get ideas from them. Uh, it, we, we should, we should be talking to each other more and relying less on a computer to give us ideas for things. And maybe, maybe I'm being critical. Like if this guy ever hears us talking about this, I invite him to like, <laughs> give us, like, give us some comments and feedback about this. Uh, like, you know, you can do like, I'm not, I'm not busting on him for doing things the way he's doing them. It's just not how I would do it. And those are my reasons why I wouldn't do it that way. The one thing I would give him some credit for would be when he was specifically outlining, like, here's how I asked these questions and here are the results that I got. He demonstrates both good and bad because mm -hmm. he asked for some non game breaking magic items and ChatGPT, or no, sorry, it was Gemini, suggested mm -hmm. a few different things, all of which I will point out were available via Google search. Mm -hmm. Very easily accessible on the internet. Uh, and one of which, it got the details of the magic item wrong. Yeah. Yeah, and that happens a, a lot. There was a ring of warmth in there that it's basically, the way it wrote it for him was that all it does is make it so you don't need cold weather gear. It keeps you warm mm -hmm. in cold environments. And I was like, "It that does sound familiar, but it seems off somehow. And I looked it up, and it's because the actual ring of warmth makes you resistant to cold damage as well. Mm. And it's like, oh, so it got close, but not quite, which is kind of AI's whole thing. Yeah. And... I, I want to go back to that screen well, as you know, we're coming to a close here because I know we said we were probably going to have a shorter episode, but now we're at like an hour. So whatever. <laughs> um, I, I want to go back to that Screen Rant uh, article about Chris Cox and AI. And in the like next to last paragraph, there was some there was a sentence there that I really liked because it just sort of sums up my opinion on on things right now. And it says, ultimately, Hasbro overestimates the importance of D&D's rules to the average player's enjoyment, right? And I take a lot away from that because I've made no secret of the fact that I'm really not a rules as written guy. I would much rather have tell a fun story. And if the rules get in the way of that, I would really rather ditch the rules and embrace the story as long as everybody at the table is, is having a good time. And I think you know, another way to read this is let's stop taking D and D so seriously. Um, and no shade on the author of the medium article, but I feel like there's an element of taking it too seriously there as well. Like it, it almost feels like let's shoot for, let's shoot for a perfect example of what I want to express creatively versus let's create a circumstance in which everybody has fun. And maybe that's because of sort of our role in the community 
as people who are trying to facilitate just folks coming together and having a fun game or something like that. But I always bristle a little bit when it feels like folks are taking D and D just a little bit too seriously. I think the, the prime example of that is him lamenting that sometimes his players will interact with NPCs that he didn't expect to need to have conversations with. Mm -hmm. And he never knows what to have those NPCs say. And so he asks generative AI and it generates for him a five sentence paragraph that he's like, this is amazing. Gosh, I don't have any NPCs that this would be appropriate for them to say, but I'm thinking of making one just so that I can use it. And it's like, no, no, don't do that. I no. feel like, I feel like too. And I do not in any way mean this as a criticism <laughs> on the writer because uh, you know, lots of circumstances can play into this, but I feel like too, if like you're invested enough in the world you've designed and you like understand it, like quote unquote, like you'll have an idea of what those people need to say. It's not going to be perfect. And maybe you don't have to do a direct quote. Maybe you can just be indirect quote it like, Oh, I want to talk to the beggar. Oh, well, instead of saying, Oh, you know, I'm a beggar and here's what I have to say. You can just be like, well, you know, you talk to the beggar, and they're talking about this, that, or the other thing. Like, you don't ever have to be exact for it. Like, it never has to be, like, immersive, I guess. And maybe that's maybe that's bad on me. I think that the other thing that I would point out is that D&D &D is, by nature, a kind of silly game. Like, it is. We're all playing pretend with each other, regardless of how serious that game of pretend might get. And the sheer fact of the matter is... If you have nothing for that character to say and all your brain is coming up with is like Seinfeld quotes, mm -hmm. then you can have the dying words of the elf soldier in the bar be a Seinfeld quote. <laughs> and the entire table will be like, what? And you're like, yeah. I don't know, man. Like, I guess he hit his head really hard. Beggar's getting very upset. <laughs> <laughs> like, I... There's nothing wrong with that. That's totally acceptable. And if you are looking at your world as such a precious and like fine thing that it cannot have those moments of silliness because you yourself have not come up with something epic for this character to say during their death, you I think you're right, Brandon. I think you might be taking it a little bit too seriously. Yeah. It's a game. Well, yeah, Enjoy and the you game. This goes back to the old trope that um, the old trope about, you know, being really protective about writing your games and stuff like that. And you even mentioned this when we were at Bird Quest doing that uh, Knives in the Backstory panel last weekend, where it's like, you know, if everything has to be perfect, then you might as well write a book like you're yeah. just going to have to when you're when other people are involved, you just have to sort of embrace the sloppiness of it because not even AI is going to be able to help you navigate and spackle that. That's just a human interaction that you're going to have to deal with. And quick segue on that, uh, if this is your first episode listening to us since Bird Quest, hi, it was great to see you out there. It was a yeah. very lovely convention to go to. It was delightful. The commute was very much worth it. It's, I think, the smallest convention we've ever worked. No, mm -hmm. wait, I take that back. We worked a convention at a Richmond Public Library. That yeah, is that the was smallest the smallest convention we've ever worked. We've ever worked. Yeah, <laughs> by far, by far. Uh, but it, it was a lovely time. I'm really glad that we went, and I uh, was glad to have met everyone that we met while we were there. And honestly, we kept saying all weekend long, we were like, these are such wonderful interactions we're having with people. Like, everybody's so nice. What's going on? Yeah, we said it was the, the first day. We were just like, this is a very wholesome con. <laughs> it was great. Um but as far as as far as this AI topic, I don't know if we've come to any conclusions today. This was just sort of an excuse for us to talk about it. The thing is, I think as long as people are pushing AI and they're making continuous changes to how it operates and they're making continuous changes to where it operates, I don't think we're going to come to a conclusion about it. Yeah. I think there are going to be circumstances wherein you and I both feel like it's appropriate for a tool such as AI to be used. And there are going to be situations where we're like, ah, yeah. 
Like I don't from, know about that. Yeah, for me, this discussion today isn't even necessarily about the ethical use of AI in in D and D, which obviously is very important because you know we haven't even talked about stuff like Mid Journey, uh, stealing the work of artists, including artists that we know. Um, but I'm just talking about like, does it make sense to use AI? There is are, right. It, are we doing it? because we can or are we doing it because it makes sense to do it and it improves the experience for everybody ethics aside which is a very privileged thing to say right does this tool actually do the thing you want it to do and the short answer is typically no right right but we'll see you know i will be i will be one of the first people to try it when they've got these tools rolled out just so I can see whether I was on the mark or I was way off. Like I always like to, when, I always like to, um, when I'm giving <laughs> uh, feedback or coaching to any of the managers that report to me about the people that report to them, I'm always like, you know, you always have to just sort of trust people and you always want to give them the opportunity to disappoint you. Like you, you, you want to presume good intention you want to presume that they're coming at it from a, a positive place, but be aware that they might disappoint you. And once that happens, then it's time for another conversation about it. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we were, we're interested to hear what you all have to say. Hop in the discord, uh, bit.ly slash goblin discord and ping us uh, in the GNG podcast channel. Let us know how you feel about this. And if you're the guy who wrote the Medium article, get in here and yell at us. Um, <laughs> side, side note, please, nobody, go find the guy and tell him to come yell at us. If he if it happens organically, that's fine. <laughs> but, yeah, but if it happens organically, sure. But we don't need actively people to yell at us more. Like, it's, you know, yeah. our yeah. lives are stressful enough as it is. Yeah. Um, also, uh, probably... Uh, this like <laughs> later today, I have to write the newsletter. So be sure to subscribe to the newsletter, uh, the Goblins and Growlers Gazette. It's monthly. Uh, I do not have it in me to send it out more than monthly. And I try to keep any sales items in it very minimal. I think I've maybe had one or two in the entire year. Uh, but mainly it just exists to give you uh, gaming news, talk about indie games, let you know where we're going to be at and do some podcast summary stuff. So in case you are picky and choosy about which episodes you listen to, you can sort of zero in on that a little bit. So sign up for that at our link tree, linktr.ee slash goblins and growlers. Uh, the link to it should be right up there at the top. Um, also, you know, listen to Quid Pro Roll, where Josh and I are cast members on there that we've been doing that uh, narrative play podcast for about six years coming up. Uh, yeah, in December, it'll be six years, I think. And uh, maybe closing in on the end of this first campaign. Um, so there's there's a lot there to catch up on. But we just had a recap episode come out. And Josh, do we have a playlist of all the recap episodes? We, we a fan created a playlist of all the recap episodes on Spotify. God bless. God bless. Uh, <laughs> and and Gabe and I both have been very specifically opening each new season on Apple Podcasts with the recap episode. So. If you have Apple Podcasts or Spotify, we have resources for you. Just come on to the Discord and we will share those out. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, we haven't we haven't pitched this on this podcast, I think, but if you like QPR and you like uh music and noise, um, Gabe, our producer and composer on that, has a bandcamp page where he has uh six tracks of uh the first part of the QPR soundtrack there, and that's gabrielperez.bandcamp.com. Check that out, and we'll put a link in there for you. Hell and yeah. Beyond that, you know, give us a five star review somewhere if uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, if you don't want to give us a five star review, tell us why, and we'll try to correct your problem because uh, uh, rather than have you give us a three star or something like that. And uh, beyond that, too, uh, don't forget to telephone, telegraph, tell a friend about the Goblins and Growlers podcast. Word of mouth is not only the greatest ludicrous album, but it is also the best way to spread the word about this podcast. I need to design a new business card for this podcast that just has a picture of ludicrous on there. And I don't even care if he sues me for it. And it just says word of mouth. Like, yeah, like exactly. What? Exactly. And then it'll be a QR code that leads you to the Goblins and Growlers <laughs> podcast. 
Uh, that might be a little misleading. We yeah. need a little bit more info than that. Yeah. And just uh, a little bit more Patreon talk. Um, early episode releases for the audio version of the podcast on Fridays ahead of the usual Monday drop. And then people on Patreon will get the video of the podcast on Monday rather than Thursday, which is when it comes out on YouTube. And then, of course, GGP deep dives. And we are, like I've said a couple of times now, working on several other regular features for the podcast, including the world building streams and things. I think maybe we still have to nail some stuff down, but I think maybe you might want to be thinking about blocking off some time close to Halloween to watch a spooky stream that we might be doing. Uh, like a live play stream. So we'll have more details about that. But uh, to find out about all that stuff, sign up for the newsletter, uh, join the Discord, uh, join the Patreon, uh, even as a free member, so you can see, sort of uh, get an idea of what all's going on there. And I think that's about it. Uh, that's everything I got. Yeah, I was trying to, I decided to do most of the end stuff myself to save your voice a little bit. I appreciate you. Yeah, and uh, this episode uh, does come in shorter than the previous two that we've done because uh, it's not quite an hour and 15 minutes that we've been recording. Uh, so as long as we end it in the next couple of minutes, we should be fine. <laughs> we'll see you all next time. All right, bye, bye. everybody. <laughs>